Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, I'm, I'm winging this slightly. I don't have my cheat sheet, so um, just bear with me if we're slightly out of order. Um, I'm going to introduce the top table. We'll start with that. Um, we'll go from my right, working right the way along the row. Um, we have uh, Mr. Scott. Next to him, Mr. Niven, Mr. Bryan, myself, then um, Mr. Elliott, our Vice Convener, Councillor Bob Braun, and we have Linda Brown acting in for um, Danny Williams from Democratic Services. Okay, has everybody received the updates and on the reports um, and the notification of the removal of the first application from today's uh, proceedings? They have, okay, that's brilliant. Um, right, uh, apologies and substitutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, the minutes of the previous meeting, can we agree them? Agreed, okay, bear with me while I sign them. Thank you. And do we have any declaration, declarations of interest in the, today's proceedings? Councillor James. Uh, convener. Um, I'm not declaring an interest as such, but in the interest of openness and transparency, item five or paper five one uh, for the quarry, Marley Quarry, uh, mentions um, Marley Loch and Marley Burn, which flows into the loch. I actually live uh, on the opposite side of the loch to that, so it's just in openness, transparency. Okay, I don't believe that to be a problem, is that correct? No, there we go, but thank you very much for that. Any other? No, thank you. Okay, um, then in that case, we will go straight on to today's proceedings and we will start with the uh, first application before us, which is an application under section 42 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act. Oh, deputation, sorry, can we agree to deputations today? I believe we have um, one deputation in the local application a bit later on. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go on to the application for section 42 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 97 to develop land without complying to the condition one of the planning permission PK920831, extraction of sand and gravel. And I will um, pass this to Mr Niven to introduce. Thank you, convener. This application relates to Marley Quarry, which is 1.6 kilometres southwest of Blair Gowdy. <coughs> It's an active sand and gravel quarry um, that extends to approximately 40 hectares, which was granted consent back in 1994 and has been providing an important source of sand and gravel for the last 18 years. Um, it had originally been anticipated that the mineral extraction would have been completed at this stage uh, and the site restored, but due to the economic crisis, there was a drop in demand between 2008 and 2014, which saw the, a reduction in the amount of materials extracted or won from the site. Therefore, the applicant is seeking to amend the terms of condition one in order to extend the time scales essentially for extraction and restoration for an additional seven years. This plan shows the overall restoration scheme itself. Um, it's uh, difficult to see there, but obviously the, the, the access that runs down to Marley Mill essentially splits the site in half. Um, the area in question where the, the majority of the the extraction in future will take place is in the um, southeastern area of the site. This first image is taken from apparently midway down the access to Marley Mill, looking east or well, northeast towards the Gowrie direction. Um, this shows the existing gravel workings and the, the existing um, ponds that are there in situ. Uh, this is a, a photograph taken again from the same point on the access midway down looking northwest across the site, looking at the stockpile area as it is at, at present. And again, this is looking at the same point, but southwest towards where the actual um, sand and gravel is taken and processed. And this is the overall plan of the entire site. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Niven. Uh, I will open this up to any questions. We have no questions. Do we have any comments? No. <laughs> Do we have a motion? Uh, Councillor Gray, uh, well, is that seconded? And Councillor James, an amendment? 
No, that is uh, approved. Thank you. Okay. Right, thank you very much. That was, uh, now we can move on to the uh, second um, application in front of us today which is an application under Section 42 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 97 to develop land without complying to conditions 1 and 2 of planning permission that is already uh, in place. And again, I will open this up to uh, Mr Niven to introduce the paper. Um, I'll just do a, a quick update first in relation to Condition 4. You should have all received a, a, a sheet yesterday with updates for the members. In the, the first update relates to this site. Um, and it's condition four. Effectively, it's the same condition, but we are updating it in order to make it more effective against any pot potential future application on this site. Moving on to the description of the site itself. Um, this application relates to sloping area of farmland located on the western edge of Milnathorpe, which is allocated um, under the current LDP um, H48 site and zoned um, as for residential um, and it is proposed to be retained under LDP2. The site, which extends to 5.2 hectares, is bound to the northwest by the M90, to the southwest by Backburn, and to the east and south lies existing housing. The proposed site presently takes access from Curlers Court for the lower area of the site and Mance Road for the upper area. Uh, outline planning permission was originally approved by Committee for Residential Development in March 2008. This consent has subsequently been extended on three separate occasions in 2011, 2000, 2013 and 2015. With this application, the applicant is again seeking to amend the terms of um, condition one in order to extend the permission for a further three years. This first photograph is taken from Mance Road looking southwest across the upper area of the site. Uh, the M90 lies immediately to the right of this photograph. This is a potential point of access for any proposed development on the site. The second photograph is a view from Curlers Crescent, looking at the access into the site itself um, for the lower area. And again, this forms a potential main access into any residential development on the site. And this final photograph is taken from the rear yard of the country store off of Stirling Road. Um, it looks up into the site. Basically, the site is where the, the ground starts to rise up. So the lower flat open field does not form part of the site. The back burn runs along the perimeter of this lower field. And effectively, the site in question is the area that slopes upwards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll open up for any questions. Councillor Drysdale. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, uh, in the papers it was indicated that uh, the recommendation on this occasion would be the, uh, the final time in which you would recommend an extension to the, the deadline. I'm conscious that, uh, you know, we've, we've been, th this process started in 2008. There's been a local development plan where, um, on the verge of LDB2, uh, a lot of water under the bridge in the last 10 years. Um, how common is it uh, that uh, that uh, there is a uh, potentially a 13-year uh, time frame between uh, between planning outline planning being granted and the, uh, the first um, bricks being laid? It's very difficult to say because obviously each site has its own merits. It depends on the situation. They have partially blamed the economic crisis leading up to this point as to the delay. There has been house builders interest in the site, but it's just not been brought forward. Um, there are There is a developer apparently interested in taking the site forward and they have stated that to us that this is the final time that they'd be seeking consent for. Now, we don't have a crystal ball. That might not come to fruition in three years time this consent may end and then we're in a situation where we're back to looking at a, a further application. Now, the reason why the report says no further renewal is because we've taken the timescale condition out and now relies upon the regulations as it stands in terms of an informative. So as per any permission that goes out now, there is no timescale condition on it. So they could not come forward in three years time and ask for another section 42 to extend 
the time scales. They would have to come in with a fresh application for plan permission in principle or a detailed application. But as it stands, it's the same owner who has owned the site all the way through. It's the Church of Scotland that own the site and it's not moved on to a developer as yet. So it's not a developer that's land banked it or a developer that's not been able to move the site forward. It's just that obviously the marketing for the site hasn't enabled them to sell the site. I believe they have renewed or refreshed that marketing and they have got more interest in the site. But notwithstanding that, we are looking to again allocate the site in LDP2. So even further forward than the three years of this permission should it get granted, it will still be in the local plan as we see being brought forward um, as an allocated site. Councillor Robertson. <coughs> uh, thank you. This is a similar question to the one that um, Councillor Drysdale asked. Um, since actually this became a quite outlined planning consent, um, times have moved on considerably. And um, could I point out on the, on, your, on the map, which is useful, on the bottom right hand corner, there's a tiny, the road coming down, you can see a very narrow part of the road at, at Western Lone. Now, the problem is that we've recently given consent for, pit down, for the um, Pace Hill development. It was down for 50 houses in the LDP. We granted consent for 80. Um, this, how, th this could be a, another potential 60 houses, uh, all feeding down into that tiny, narrow road in, in Western Lone. And I don't know if you've looked at the, the letters and, and the, the, um, the, the, the problems with this application, but it's because all these developments are now coming forward um, and, and there's more and more, much more housing north of Milnathor all feeding down into that tiny road. And there's nothing in the application at all to see how we'll cope with that growing problem in Western Lone. So could I have a, a comment on what proposals are that I don't know about are not in the plan to deal with the traffic issues in Western Lone that could result from this development. It is very difficult at this stage to actually anticipate that because this is an in principle application so we don't know the overall numbers but you're right there's an anticipated number. Now there's a, a, a change and a potential increase in the overall number that's anticipated <coughs> even in LDP2. Um, uh, roads have looked at that matter and have looked at the, the road infrastructure in the area they're satisfied that obviously this site and other sites can feed into the existing network without a significant impact. That said, that would need to be assessed at the time this application came in, in tandem with other approved developments, now acknowledging Pace Hill and other developments in the area. But what we'll do is I'll pass this over to Dean Salmon for, for further comment. Essentially, sort of reiterating the same point where we would have to assess the detailed application on its merits when it came in, and the, that assessment may come to various conclusions. There may need to be uh, more traffic control measures put in place. There, there may not. I can't comment with any certainty at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was, that's helpful. Um, so th there could be traffic controls actually brought into place to deal with the 80 houses at Pace Hill and the potential 60 houses here and the traffic, the, the, the traffic that will generate, that could be a thing that could be done in the future. Again, it would very much depend on what the assessment says. Uh, I, as I say, I can't comment. Okay. So on the, on the basis of that, can I possibly, sorry, Mr. Elliot, I'm coming to you now. <laughs> on, the <laughs> on, on the basis of that, um, would it be um, possible to defer this um, application until we get, the, I would, I, I'd be unhappy myself to, to, to pass it without knowing exactly what the implications are and what measures could be put in place with regard to conditions and other things to, to alleviate the existing problem that exists in Western Loan. Would that be a, a possible thing to do? No, I don't think um, that would be the appropriate course of action, Councillor Robertson. This is uh, already an existing um, IPN and it's looking for renewal and you're concentrating on the renewal aspects. And yes, there are other aspects to look at as well. But I think you've already had the answer in that when it comes to a developer wanting to build, they will have to apply for approved matters. And in the approved matters process, there will be an assessment. So you will get the details there. It will be assessed. And if there's need 
for measures to be done that you know obviously transportation agree to, then you would expect those to be followed through. So you have, how shall we say, some comfort and security that there's a still a process there that will address it. It's not as if it won't be addressed. It will be addressed through the process. So it's quite okay to, to grant this, um, knowing that there could be serious traffic implications as a result of it that are not reflect. Could we reflect that in this report then? Could we add another condition to this report? I think the, the, the thing to probably stress is that this is um, ap applying to extend the time period rather than assess the principle of the application. So that's obviously been established in the past. Um, the, the key part probably is that as Dean and David picked up on is that there are the conditions in the consent already that they'll have to address when they come back with the details. We'll have to look at the, the traffic implications. And as Dean Solman quite rightly said, it may well require that there are, uh, as a result of that, there are further requirements placed on the developer to ensure that traffic is dealt with adequately to, to address the very problems that you're referring to. So I think it, the, the, the two po key points are, one, it's, it, the principle's already been established, this is renewing it. Secondly, that there will be conditions in place which will have to address the traffic implications of that amount of traffic going through that system. Can you say much more? So it wouldn't be possible for me to ask that it be particularly noted in the conditions that um, the situation that currently exists at Western Loan be recognised? Well, in assessing the detailed application that will eventually come through, hopefully, that the part of that assessment will be recognising the impact that this development will have on the existing system. Does that help? Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? No, do we have any uh, comments on it? No? Okay, can we uh, move the paper? Okay. Oh, uh, agreed. <laughs> okay, so we have... I, I would still like a, a special note to put in the conditions that um, the current uh, situation with traffic in Western Loan be recognised and that the, the developer, when they come forward, be asked to specifically um, bring forward the proposals that will deal with the, the, the traffic that currently, problem that currently exists there. I, I'm, I'm sorry, are we able to do that? I, well, my it understanding is we're it's not a big thing to ask. No, what we could add, add uh, part of the condition, which I think would assess uh, Councillor Robertson, is that we could, as part of the details required, subsequent to this consent, if that's the decision today, would be the submission of a, a transport assessment, which would have to address that very issue that you're talking about. Okay, can that particularly note it down then? Yes, we'll, we'll, we will uh, add that. If, if members are agreeable to that, we will add they a will condition have. relating to that. Councillor uh, James, do you want to say something? Yeah, convener, uh, it's, I think it's already covered in the recommendations or, or the conditions in the recommendations, num uh, condition number one says it, um, development means of access serving the development. Um, so, so we're actually taking that into consideration with that condition anyway. Yes, but it only actually deals with the two access roads, Mans Road and Curlers Crescent. It doesn't actually specifically mention Wester Loan, which as you can see is a good way away from the entrances to the site in the bottom right-hand corner of that um, map. Okay, but we have an agreement that we'll get that added. Okay, so can we move the paper? We have a Councillor James, thank you. Um, with the condition added, do we have a seconder? Um, Councillor Drysdale, are there any amendments to the paper? No, nope, then the paper is approved, thank you. <coughs> okay. Right, so we now move on to the next uh, application in front of us, which is uh, uh, the formation of access road, turning head, soak away and installation of LPG tanks and associated works at land 110 metres southeast of Bullfield in Balado. Now, this um, already has consent and um, the application... Oh, have I missed one? I'm sorry. I was doing Jamie at his job there for a minute. Sorry. I do apologise. I said, I said this was going to go a bit bizarre because I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me. Anyway. 
we'll, we'll go back a little bit. Okay, um, this is the erection of 43 dwelling houses, formation of Suds Pond, landscaping and associated works um, at a land 100 metres west of Glover Arms and East Hunting Tower in Perth. And I ask uh, Jamie Scott to introduce the report. Thank you, Kavino. Yes, uh, approval of matters specified in condition is being sought for the 43 dwelling houses. Members may be aware that the, the plan in front of you just now, the blue site uh, and indeed the, the red site cumulatively have planning permission in principle, which the Development uh, Management Committee approved in January 2017 and permission was issued in February 2018. So the application site in front of us today is that red line uh, in isolation. So that represents phase one of the wider development. I'll touch on that in a little bit more detail later on. But suffice to say that the, the site is a brownfield site um, it's got planning permission principle. It's not specifically allocated within the local development plan, but essentially it's an infill or an opportunity site. Um, it has no real land use at the moment. And again, I'll show you that in more detail in terms of photographs. Um, it's proposed to access the site using the existing access that serves the Glover Arms Dobby's Garden Centre, which is a direct um, access controlled by traffic lights on the trunk road, the A85. So this is a proposed site plan. Um, it's the top right-hand corner that's relevant for consideration today, which is the red line site boundary. Just to clarify, the orientation of this plan is different than the last. So the right-hand side is north and uh, the left-hand side is south. So you'll see there that the 43 dwellings are proposed in the northwest corner and there's an indication that a future application is to come forward for the remaining site. You'll note from the report that we have actually now received a further application for matters specified for that site, but that's not subject of consideration today, but that will come through in due course for phases two through five, and it's the 43 dwellings on that layout which we're considering. This is the first photo taken in less uh, inclement weather earlier on in the year. You'll see that this is from the southern, well, towards the southern end of the site, looking north back towards the application site. Just to highlight, you'll probably see in the, the distance Hunting Tower Castle, which is obviously a substantial feature within the landscape, indeed as a listed building and scheduled monument. The report again refers to potential archaeological interest on this site. It has been developed before, but um, this, the program of archaeological works recommended within the report is an important one because it's, it's expected that there'll be some yield of archaeological evidence relating to the castle and an historic battle which took place in the locality. Just to point out other um, for uh, locational factors, the white building is the Glover's Arm and to the right of the, sorry, it's Dobby's Garden Centre and Glover's Arm to the right of shop. And the A, A9 is immediately bounded on the eastern boundary and on the west, the tree line there, there's a, a core path and beyond that it's uh, Perth West, which is an allocated housing site. This is taken further north, which is um, off the access road, just the immediate south of the Glover Arms. So this would serve access to the development Roughly uh, speaking, where the, the existing road which used to go into the Mark site would form the southern boundary of the site and provide access directly into it. And it's that parcel of land that's uh, surrounded by the two roads that's subject of the application today. This is a closer view of the majority of that site. As you can see, it's in a, a, an undeveloped state, um, not being used in any formal manner since the Mark has closed. This just shows that you'll see in the, the foreground there that A85 and the dwellings that uh, front on to it. This is a montage produced by the, the applicant in support of the proposal. This is essentially showing the typical street scene of the dwellings as they would front around onto the Suds Basin. So the Suds is proposed in the northeast corner of the site. And this is just giving you an illustration of what the development aspires to be. And this is a close-up, so a cropped version of the proposed site plan. So you see in more detail the layout that's proposed. Again, the Suds Basin uh, being the feature as you would enter into the site, there would be two vehicle access points and a fairly rectilinear layout um, with a few features uh, to accommodate car parking off the street and also as the site fronts on its northern boundary to the A85, three of the four dwellings are fronting onto the street, uh, albeit a level about two and a half, three metres higher than the A85, just to give a bit more of an active frontage. Uh, and the site in itself will be supplemented by existing trees, which you'll see on the, the plan there to the, the top end of the, the image, which is actually the western boundary. And this doesn't quite show all of the landscaping proposed. There are actually a number of other trees proposed in and around the Suds Basin and dotted through the site um, as compensatory and replacement planting because some trees will require to come down in order to accommodate the initial construction, but they will be replaced as part of the proposal. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Um, did I um, just again just to check that everybody got the um, the um, notification and the uh, update regarding the conditions, etc. So we've all received that. Okay. So I'm opening this up to any questions. Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Um, in, con in condition eight, uh, it mentions uh, uh, that until a MOVA, MOVA, or equivalent traffic signal control system is installed, um, that we know that the A85 obviously is, is, is quite a, a busy, it may not be tiny, but it's certainly a, a very busy road. And uh, would this MOVA system um, it, it control the traffic all the way down Creef Road? or is or what is the whole purpose of this, um, and, and what, what advantage would it have over the lights that we have over there already? Mr. Salmon. Essentially, what it does is it aligns up the this different sets of lights, so they're not standalone. So that way, you can essentially maximise the traffic flow. So you you know they're basically timed such that they go gr you know green consecutively, uh, which will improve traffic flow. Uh, thank you for that. I understood that the, the last set it was put in there but did that, but obviously it doesn't. Not to my knowledge, I'm afraid. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Braun? Thank you, Convener. It was just probably to follow on a little bit what Councillor Anderson was saying. and That was all the um, egress points is through that one road, existing road, and I'm, I'm just wondering, bearing in mind the number of houses, the the, um, the restaurant there, there's a hotel there, the Dobby's there. Is that traffic light system going to be sufficient to cater all that traffic coming through, um, particularly with, with more houses coming in? I just wonder if that's, there's any plans to change that system. Yeah, the application that we have before us, the in principle um, consent, it required uh, an updated traffic uh, statement essentially to show, because at that stage we didn't know the number of dwellings. This coming forward is phase one, but the the statement has been considered on the whole site basis and to assess whether this would have an adverse impact on the, the road network, the trunk road and further afield. And we're satisfied that the scale of development proposed before us today of the 43 dwellings will not have an impact and the solutions for the traffic management in the locality for the, the lights and indeed uh, the wider scheme. There's a condition also within the principle that no more than 100 dwellings on the, the site can be developed and occupied before the A9885 works are complete. So it's taken kind of a phased basis that clearly this is only going to get some way towards that 100, but cumulatively we don't have any concerns with this scale of development having any impact on the local road network. Councillor Drysdale. Thank, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, uh, just um, I'm conscious that the um, the nature of the the properties um, to be constructed on this site are completely different from the existing properties on the other side of the road, which are traditional uh, old style bungalows, etc. Um, can can you confirm? I'm sure it is the case, but I just wanted to to be uh, to be clear that. Um, neighbours on the other side of the road have been notified of this proposal and that no objections have been received? Yeah, I can confirm that anybody within the 20 metre boundary, so the red line there does touch on quite a lot of the properties, but because the properties along the 85, I think it's a, like 160 metre stretch, they might not all have been directly notified, but certainly through the planning permission and principle and this application being advertised, we have received some comments uh, previously. Um, we don't think there's going to be any adverse amenity impact. Clearly, they're going to have a built form in front of them. We've considered it, notwithstanding the receipt of any representation, is obviously an important factor. That's why we did seek to have more dwellings facing onto the road to try and mimic that to some extent. Clearly, they're going to be of a different design and appearance to the traditional cottages uh, as they would be. And we don't think that causes an unacceptable design solution. Uh, and we feel as though turning them onto the 85 uh, at least pays some cognizance of that pattern of development. Okay, any further questions? No, do we have any comments? Oh, sorry, Councillor Coates. It's not a question, it's a comment, Convener. The, um, this site was proposed for a supermarket and the amount of traffic that that would have generated would be far, far in excess of what the housing development 
is going to generate. And I feel that um, it's, it's an area of land that really does need something doing with it. It's basically a derelict piece of land that stood there for a long, well, for as long as I've ever been in Perth. And I think we really need to do something with it. Thank you. Councillor James? Uh, I think Councillor Coates has pretty much echoed everything that I was going to say. Uh, I mean, I, I use this road on a daily basis because uh, I work up just up the road. And to see this develop, I, I think, is an absolute bonus. What I'm particularly pleased with I is that it's not, I don't think this is overdeveloped. And we're actually getting proper family homes with gardens rather than trying to bung, maximise, you know, tiny homes with no garden. I think it's. I think this would be a, 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 an absolute bonus to the area. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you, convener. Yes, um, I think one has to take on board that um, the the traffic generated when it was a, a cattle market. Um, I, 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 I was it was busy. Um, at that time, and uh, it, it seemed to work uh, all okay, though the lights, uh, which are getting addressed, uh, did seem to at times become a problem. Um, the, the, the fact that since the cattle market, it's been left uh, standing idle, and uh, the, the, the state of it got into um, with fly tipping, etc., um, I'm glad to see that now we have managed to get to a, a, a developer on board uh, to come forward, and I'd be quite happy to um, um, a, um, go forward with this. And uh, um, would you like to move the paper? Move the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Do, do we have a Got second? Got there eventually. <laughs> do we have a second, <laughs> Councillor Gray? Thank you. Yeah, happy second that. Uh, it's an in-principle site previously, and therefore, you know, <laughs> we're referring to the design detail here, and I can't see anything against the design which would uh, require it to be refused. Uh, I happily second Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Can I say that that's, uh, um, um, uh, the motion has been moved forward with the amendments? Yeah, thank you. Is there, um, uh, do we have uh, an amendment to it? No. Can we say the paper is, is passed? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, a little bit of deja vu for everybody. Um, okay, the next paper before us is a paper of formation uh, for access road, turning head, soak away, and installation of LPG tanks and associated works at land 110 metres southeast of Bullfield in Balado. And as I stated already today, but um, here we are, the consent has already been, been passed for this, and I um, put it forward to um, Mr. Bryan to uh, introduce the paper. Thank you, convener. Yes, as you rightly said, this, this site already has consent for eight houses. So the application is relates to changes to the road itself and the infrastructure at the back for drainage and doesn't relate to the actual erection of houses in, them, in themselves. So issues of traffic generation have already been addressed through the previous consent. Um, just before we start, I'd like to just um, make an update on condition two of the recommendation. which relates to the works required to be carried out uh, on the site prior to it being completed or brought into use. I'd like to suggest that the wording of that is changed slightly to ensure that the services to, the, to serve the eight houses, if consent is granted today, are com completed at the very start of the development, and that would be to reduce the impact on the existing residents of the, the, uh, on the existing access driveway. So the, the first still you see here shows the proposed eight houses in the layout. And as you can see, it's served off an existing driveway which extends to the, um, to the, the, right, the left hand side of that and then extends around through a right hand turn into the main spine road in the actual village itself. The first still you can see is taken from the main road in the village and this is extending down uh, in the, the, the center of the, the photograph and you can see there. The, the two houses uh, that you can see in that image 
are the existing houses which are part of the existing private access into the, the area which would serve the proposed houses. So where you can see the access there bends slightly to the right, that's the existing driveway off which the, uh, the development would be served. And this is just taken a little bit further along. You can see the same two houses, but this is looking now down towards the bend in the road, and it's the right-hand turn that I referred to. And at that point where the, the road then turns to the left in, in the, the image there, that's where the development will eventually end, uh, join the proposed site. This is just taken a little bit further around here. The, um, the image here, you can see two existing houses, and towards the left-hand side, you can see a gate there, and it's at that point where the, ap the application site itself starts. So the road you can see there turning through a right-hand turn um, is the existing private access driveway, which will, uh, is the one that's proposed for uh, amendment today, and the, the application site extends beyond that through into the adjacent field. And this is a, a further view looking down that final stretch of the existing driveway, houses either side, and the application site immediately behind the fence and gate that you can see in the centre ground. And this view is looking into the application site. And this is looking back across to existing houses on the far side. And the views that we saw previously lie to the left-hand side of this image. And this is just to show the extent of the application site. And a further view looking, this is taken directly from the, the, the uh, access point into the site. So you're again looking across the area to be developed. This is at right angles to the previous shot that you just saw. And we're back then to the layout of the site. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Um, we have uh, Mr. John Blair, um, the, uh, the agent with us today. Um, I think come forward, sir. Um, you have uh, five minutes to address the committee. Um, we'll notify you um, with, well, within a minute to go. Sure, we won't require it. Okay, <laughs> um, thank very you. Quickly, I was only really wanting to come up and uh, see if the, anybody had any questions. You know, that's the only reason I'm here. I, I, I think everything's been covered in the reports. We're quite happy with conditions. You know, it's fairly straightforward from our point of view. So it was just if anybody had any questions. Okay, Thank I you. open up. Um, Councillor Barnacle. Good morning. Good morning. Um, paragraph 48 of the report refers to the legal challenge by householders against your applicant Indeed. with regard to the servitude rights of access, mm -hmm. which your applicant won. Yes. However, as part of the ruling, the sheriff cast doubt on the effectiveness of any condition for upgrading the road to adoptable standard. I understand, however, that the Serbian proprietors are not required to agree such adoption works. Are you effectively proposing development on the title of four properties over which you have no control? No, I mean, I think that from my point of view, what they were saying was the four properties are not required to adopt the road. Um, now, it needs to be to adoptable standards, but they don't have to require it from my point of view, because that's what the, the sheriff was saying. You do understand that legal recourse remains an option based on that ruling? Oh, yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's separate from this completely on the legal side of things. It was purely the fact that the original application going back to 2013 had been refused by the, uh, the reporter on the basis that they couldn't produce an RCC. Um, the deed of servitude was specifically worded to say that the road being widened and upgraded had to be to the Curtain Commerce Council's requirements. You know, so it's not what we proposed, it's what's required by transportation. Thank you. Um, I have a sec another question. Not related to that. Okay, certainly. Um, LDP2 states that all new development should be connected to mains drainage, a requirement introduced by local members. Um, would you not agree that the sites above five houses in the Loch Leven catchment, this is preferable? And if you do agree, did you have any dialogue with Scottish Water over that possibility? We've talked to Scottish Water, however, the, the mains sewers are you know, out with their control 
know, it's quite a landlocked site, and you know, we don't have any scope to go through. I mean, it's obviously a very sensitive site. The applicant, you know, his neighbours don't want the application to um, go ahead. So I don't see any possibility that they'd be happy to have their ground dug up, you know, to connect into the mains, which is, you know, considered the distance away. Do we have any other uh, any other questions? No, no questions. Mr. Blair, thank you very much indeed. Okay, do we have any questions for officers? Councillor Waters. Sorry about that. Thank you, convener. I was just wondering if officers could. Um, clear up some confusion I have with between uh, this application and the previous one. Um, on the 24th of April, uh, at the previous application, uh, SEPA uh, included a clause which Councillor Barnacle uh, related to fed through into the new LDP2 that's proposed. And it say, just says, can, if you don't mind if I can read it out, um, th there is a pub public sewer infrastructure in the vicinity of these proposed developments and we urge Perthing and Ross Council and applicants to consider these, deve th these four developments jointly with a view of construction connection to the public sewer as a condition of planning consent and then there's a you know, relation to a, 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 a statement, a policy statement and various, I assume, is legal, is legal stuff. Now I understand SEPA have... have um, in the, this application and they're saying that they're withdrawing the application um, for, for the uh, soak away um, in relation to the private water supply specifically. Um, and I just wonder w what's the relationship, do we understand, is, are they compatible statements or is SEPA just dealing with this one as a, for the water treatment rather than, the, the, than a policy as whole with, with Bellado? Uh, where they definitely previously said that they didn't, they didn't believe that any houses should be built in Bolado without any of the new developments should be built without connecting into the main sewerage. Is there? Do you have any uh, any more information into why, why? And I don't know if is there a reversal by SEPA. I don't know if they're they're different. If they're different, what they're saying, but it, it is causing me a little bit of confusion to understand how both of them fit together. Thank you. Yes, I think the, the previous statement that you referred to by SEPA related to d developments in the generality in the Bolado area, because obviously there will be more than one site um, proposed. The SEPA are satisfied with the current proposals in terms of the numbers uh, and the, the, um, the, the private drainage facilities proposed on the back of that development or this current development, and they've no objection on that basis. Uh, they're, they're happy with the, the uh, arrangements that are, would be in place for this development and the phosphate mitigation that would go with that and the, the properties that would be tied into that. And as part of that, we're recommending the, the standard conditions which have been agreed with both SEPA and SNH as part of the local even catchment protocol. So all parties are satisfied that that could be delivered through a consent with those conditions. Supplementary. So, so I understand we're, we've only to take the application that's before us, uh, and, and obviously, uh, as Councillor Barnacle, with all the elected members, when we read the SEPA statement on the generality that should be covered in the LDP2, which is going forward, so so, uh, how does that relate to this to this specific application? Um, what weight should be, you know, this policy statement that SEPA came out with the, has found its way within the statement to LDP2, which obviously is not active yet, but what weight with that for the benefit of um, <coughs> the, the whole community of Bellado should we be applying to this specific uh, application? Well, I, I believe that um, the information uh, you have on LDP2 is purely for information purposes. That process is still ongoing. It is not an adopted um, policy yet. Um, so there is, it's for information and right that it is um, referred to, but I'll, I'll pass on to Mr. Bryan for any additional information. Yes, convenient, absolutely correct. And as, as you aware, the timescale for LDP2 
is that it's still to go before full council in, on the 21st of August. And depending on the outcome of, of that, then that would go to a reporter in due course, which would be into next year. So uh, um, it would be premature to make a decision uh, to, to give too much materiality to that at this stage on a, a current application. And although SEPA have commented on the generality of private drainage versus public drainage in that area, that's a comment in relation to LDP2, and that hasn't been endorsed in terms of going through that formal process yet. So that would be given limited weight at this stage, uh, equally in relation to the, the site the site status in LDP2 as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so I, understand, I, I accept the uh, I accept the LDP2. No, no problem with that. But the general the general statement, which was actually given as part of this application previously, and this is where I'm that I'm getting confused for the SEPA stance point on this. That they're saying they've 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 they've. Uh, there's no more objections with this application, and yet previously they said we have a general objection to it all regarding bladder. Is that is that does that still stand? Is that is that still a, a, you know is that still a material um, a consideration that we as a committee should be taking in for the benefit of Blado as a whole uh, regarding drainage? That they have they have said that they have a policy on it initially. And and we're we, we have got to treat that as a material, or are we saying that because SEPA have now not raised that in the most recent communication with that, that that's not mo not applicable anymore? Yes, I think we have to work on the basis of what SEPA have commented on on the current application, and that's a, no objection to this development being served by a private drainage facility. Um, so that that's the position as far as this is concerned. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll see from the report there have been a series of applications on this site and um, one of the key considerations today and in our assessment of the application is there is an extant consent on the site for which SEPA uh, were satisfied with the private drainage arrangements and this application is on a similar basis. It's to be served by private drainage facilities and SEPA have not objected to that and they, might, they, they obviously do have a wider aspiration to get as many properties connected to the main sewer as possible and that's something that they've commented on in relation to this site and um, Bellardo generally's uh, consideration through LDP2, but we're not at that stage yet, and we are dealing with this application, and on that basis, SEPA are happy with the proposal. Thank you. Any other further questions? Councillor Barnacle. Yeah, I have a number of questions for uh, legal and planning. Um, first of all, just picking up on Councillor Watter's points about SEPA, they appear to have surprisingly changed their position, which is a major concern for the residents who access private water supplies. The proposed soakaway is 160 metres from the private supply, but my understanding is that normally SEPA consider 500 metres more appropriate. If there was any contamination to the water supply, to occur if we were to agree this, would it be the council's responsibility for uh, accepting this change? Would it be the council's responsibility, not SEPA's, if contamination occurred? That's a, a question <coughs> for the legal officer. The, the, the planning points if we could just refer to the site history, paragraphs 28 to 30, I would ask you to note that the reporter upheld the committee in refusing the original application in March 16. At the September 16 committee, I was not present, otherwise I would have argued for refusal took a year from that to issue a decision notice. And personally, I think the reporter to LDP2 would support the site's exclusion. I'll tell you why. You need to bear in mind it's not really brought out in the report. The zoning of this Bowfield site has gone through a number of changes. In the 2004 plan, it wasn't in. 
it was included as white land in LDP1 after a late change. A resident filed a complaint regarding the lack of consultation with local members on the changes to the boundary. This complaint was partially upheld by the council. Paragraphs 25 to 27 refers to LDP2. Since the local members unanimously moved an amendment for the site's exclusion and for mains drainage, it is very unlikely they would change their position going forward. In these circumstances, surely LDP2 should carry more weight. And I would like to know if forward planning were consulted on this application because they say, have said to me, mains drainage is a feasible option for any new development if connected to Balado Crossroads development plans. That seems to have been totally ignored. Also, I'm mystified why you can recommend approval after a co committee rejection in August 17, referred to by Councillor Waters, that led to the LDP2 change, bearing in mind that in April 18, I was told by planning that at that time there was no current consent for residential development. So what's, what's actually changed? So there you go, that's my summation. I'd like a, a response to that. Um, who would, who would like to go first? Well, I'll pitch in with the planning questions, okay. if, if I remember, and correct me if I miss anything Mr. out, Mr. Councillor Brown. Martin. Um, but on the, on the history of the, the uh, consideration of this application, uh, its inclusion in LDP was as white land, as you rightly said, within the settlement boundary. And that was, that was in the details which were put to full council as part of LDP before it went to the reporter. So the, the proposal was up for discussion and consideration. So it's gone through the correct procedure to be included at that stage and is therefore in the adopted development plan. Um, this application was consulted with forward planning who are fully aware of the situation and they re recognise the position both in relation to the, uh, the forthcoming LDP2 considerations but also in relation to the extant consent on the site. In terms of the history of the development, um, as I, I did touch on earlier on, there's been a series of um, applications which have had different outcomes. I think it's, it's important to set out that the original application in 2013, which was refused by committee for several reasons, um, when it went to the reporter, the reporter dismissed it for none of the reasons and did not agree with any of the reasons that committee at that time had refused it, but refused it on the, the grounds of the access arrangements, which have uh, already been referred to. So the, the subsequent application, which was eventually consented, had only had to really address the concern that the reporter had raised at that time, which it did, and led to committee being uh, of a mind to approve that application. The most recent application, which was refused, was um, because the, the, the applicant at that stage hadn't been able to address fully <coughs> the drainage arrangements, but they've now been able to address that to the satisfaction of both SEPA and uh, our own officers. So maybe ask Colin if he has any comments on from the, the legal point of view. Um, <coughs> can I just reiterate the general context here? The report of handling already has paragraphs in terms of LDP2, and I'm just looking for them. It is page 135, paragraphs 25, 27. And paragraph 27 clearly states that uh, it should be, I think it's limited weight. Um, yes, yes, limited weight. And there's a reason for that, as referred to earlier on, where it's still a relatively early stage in the LDP2 process. It's still to go back to full council, matter will not fully agree to it, and then it would have to go to the reporters for a potential examination, and only then would it, does it become the LDP2 itself, and then becomes legally effective. So at this stage, whilst you could, you would, we would call it a material consideration, you would only give it limited weight. Now, um, not most perhaps unusually, but there are um, circumstances in this case which are much, much stronger considerations, which is the extant consent. And that extant consent could be built out. 
what this application is about. I, I accept there may be a challenge against it for other, you know, other ways by the, the, the four occupiers. But with that extant consent, that must be taken into account. In my view, it's a very strong consideration. And what this application is looking to do is amend aspects of that consent. Uh, so that's the very general context. Um, I do appreciate that uh, at the moment, uh, um, members have uh, looked to remove it out of the settlement boundary. However, you still have the extant consent and it could be on the face of it built out. Now, Councillor Barnacle, uh, you also refer to the private water supply. Now, I don't think, uh, say that I'm any expert in that area, but what I would say is the report of handling indicates uh, that it's been assessed and that the, the, the runoff is going in a different direction. So there's been an assessment and it says that there, sh there shouldn't be that issue. In terms of responsibility as a council, and I'm going to talk very general here, not so much specifics, very general, we are here to make a decision on granting a consent. Um, the responsibility, we are relying of, um, in part on CFIC's response here, and should there be any difficulty, then uh, that would be a private matter that wouldn't come back on the liability of this council under normal circumstances. I can't say more than that because you're getting into specifics. We don't, you know, we don't know um, if a, a situation arises, then we'd have to look at on its specifics. But in general terms, no, the council does not have liability for taking a decision on a planning commission. Okay, I, I, I suspect that could be challenged legally, but I accept your view. Okay, do we have any other questions? No, okay, do we have, uh, Councillor James? <laughs> so I can be there, I'll be out of it. Um, Ray, it's just, I'm struggling to, to get my head around this, if I'm honest. We're looking at a site which is, um, to gain access to it, we're going across private land, you know, which, is, it, which isn't within the applicant's ownership. So he's looking to go across land which is currently owned by somebody else. Am I right in thinking that or not? Are we, we, are we being, I'm just conscious of this legal challenge. The, the road that we're looking to get access through doesn't actually belong to the applicant for this site. Yeah. Uh, Councillor James, in, in technical terms, you are right. As I understand it, the applicant does not own the land in which the access road is proposed to be constructed. However, um, and what the court case was all about was um, a deed of servitude. So there's a servitude right, a legal right to um, go through, construct that road and go through on the face of it. So therefore, it's not really a question of ownership. Um, there was an indication that there is a legal right to do that. It's been disputed, of course, I understand that. that and there was, in terms of the servitude, the de servitude, uh, the sheriff indicated that was clear and precise enough, so that is, that, that was not reduced, that remains in place. Yes, <laughs> Thanks, convener. Further to that then, uh, am I also right in thinking that although our policy says that they have to connect in the Loch Leven area, catchment area, they have to connect to main drainage. These particular properties aren't connected to main, have they got their own private drainage? Is that the way I'm seeing it? Sorry. Well, our policy doesn't formally require them to be connected. I think what Councillor Barnacle was suggesting that the, 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 the proposal as part of LDP2, that they should be connected. And the existing houses there are on private systems and the application has been assessed on that basis. Okay, any further questions? No, okay. Um, can we move the paper? Oh, sorry, Councillor Coates, I apologise. Just a comment. It's something that I'm very familiar with, that these um, private water systems and private drainage systems and everything else are quite prevalent in Perth and Kinross. But I think it's time that, as a council, we moved on and we made all new housing have to connect to the mains drainage system and the mains water system. Private water systems are invariably doubtful, shall we say. Well, thank you very much for your comment. Um, we, we are dealing with an application that already has consent. 
And what, what's in front of us is actually a, a, a road access, um, a, a reduction in effect. So the, uh, the issues that you have raised are being looked at in LDP2, but that's already been stated that that has not been adopted yet. And um, the information from LDP2 is put in the report for your information purposes and has some bearing, but isn't a legal um, framework. So thank you very much. So can we move the paper? I'd like to move against the paper, convener. Well, um, I would like to say that neither the community or the local members support the development of the Bowfield site. And it seems to me that the planning department have greatly facilitated development proposals for this site in dialogue since 2011 but have not extended such cooperation to the community or given it reassurance. There are guidelines nationally limiting development on private roads that appear to be ignored. Since the existing residents are against road adoption, paragraph 63 implies collection of 24 bins at the road end if we approve this. Kinross CC's objection in paragraph 32 is noted I agree with it in its entirety, and they are meeting tonight. It will be interesting to what I can report to them. In my view, the application should be refused. The site should not be developed, and LDB, LDP2 in current form should progress. My reasons, approving the report would be contrary to LDP, LDP2, which I think does have some status. Place making criteria policy PM1A, residential amenity RD1 and policy EP3B on drainage. I believe that the proposal is contrary to policies on the protection of the Loch Leven catchment. So that's my basis for moving refusal. So, Brian, if I could come back to the LDP2 issue and leave that till last. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that the policies you refer to are LDP1, PM1E, RD1, and EP3B. Are those our LDP1, the current LDP, are those you're referring to? Yeah. So, in terms, if I deal with those in order, you refer to the policies, but I, was, uh, I, I didn't get why those policies are breached. And if I deal with policy PM1A, first of all, um, that's about um, must contribute to possibly quality of surrounding built natural environment. Uh, for, uh, design density and siting development should respect character and range of the place. Now, Par paragraph 15, I'm saying that it's the proposal does not do what paragraph 15 says. Sorry, paragraph? In the report. in what respect though, Councillor Barnett, that's sort of, and before you comment further, I would just like to add in that my recollection is in the 13 application that was refused on grounds of density, if I remember right, and that was not accepted by the reporter. Um, so in terms of policy PM1A, what I'm asking Councillor Barnett is, you're indicating you don't feel that the application complies with that. What I'm asking is, in light of an existing consent where matters have already been considered in, uh, uh, in quite some detail, and granted, where does this application for an amended access road and suds arrangement, where does that application breach policy PM1A? Yeah, yeah. Well, you're not respecting the character and amenity of the place by putting an access road to a new development along a drive to private properties. How can that be respecting the character and amenity of the place? It doesn't do it. Um, that's not uncommon with other situations, Councillor Barnacle, but your problem, the difficulty there is that's already in the existing consent. So yeah, what's, changed, what's changed What's changed with the existing consent? The application is for that road access. That's right, but the existing consent also has that. 
talk, I don't understand the difference between Sorry, the Jim, two. So why I, I think there's a, a slight, can I just ask for a point of clarification? I believe that if we are minded to refuse this application, the 2016 agreed consent is still applies and that the developer can continue on that. Yes, but he, he cannot develop this. The, the site is on developable, on, what's the word? <laughs> the site cannot be developed Deliver. until <laughs> the Deliver. access road is properly sorted out with the agree, I would suggest with the agreement of the people whose property it is. I'm sorry, I, I know I'm, I'm asking for clarification here, I'm really, I, I can talk to him. but the, um, there's consent already for the road to be wider than it is right now. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. But in this application, there is the, the actual the consent that applies yes, for the, the road. The previous consent is, is for a slightly wider access. I mean, the, the same issue applies in, in for the developer, whichever uh, proposal he would want to implement in terms of getting the, the, the ability to div, uh, construct the access on the existing driveway. But we, there's obviously a legal position there that's been talked about. But that, that is what the position is in relation to the existing consent as well. But I think in terms of the, if we, the couple of the reasons that have been put forward for refusal in terms of the um, placemaking and also the impact on neighbouring residential amenity, these were reasons for refusal on the original application that the reporter did not agree with. So they've already been considered by a reporter. Yeah, but he's just one man though, isn't he? With one opinion. Yeah, but it was a very important opinion on that appeal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I can only make my assessment of the application and my judgment on the policies that apply. I mean, that's the position. Um, if, if you think that's not going to hold water, then what can I say to that? The debate up here is that we, um, we require um, competent reasons for, for uh, the, the refusal, um, which we're trying to, to understand. And, and um, I think yeah. um, it's a matter for members, but at the moment where um, I think we're at is you have listed um, three policy grounds. We have only partially discussed one. I am still unclear as to where those policy, policies have been breached. And to put forward a competent motion, we have, must have both the policy and why breached and sometimes you know, detailed justification. Now, uh, and that's even without referring to LG32. Um, I think perhaps we may be best if we adjourn so that myself and Mr. Bryan can speak to Councillor Barnacle um, just to cover those, to understand what is being proposed uh, in terms of refusal and so that that motion can be articulated if members think that appropriate. Would that be appropriate? Sorry, Councillor Roberts. Could, could I possibly formally second Councillor Barnacle's motion so that, that to allow you to take that forward um, for, for a number of reasons. I think, um, as, as, as Councillor Barnacle said, to, to, to create a road along some people's driveways is totally unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm also really concerned about the the potential soak away and the effect it could have on the, on the private water supply. As everybody knows, um, Bellado was built on gravel and gravel, <laughs> fluids seep through gravel into, into underground wells. So I have a concern about that. I think as you said, uh, Councillor Coates, we should always try and connect all new developments into the, the public sewer system and public water supply. And that's what we've been trying to do in LDP2, the local members of Condosha. So for these reasons, I, I would ask that the refusal is now. 
Okay, thank you. Well, we'll take a, a, a short recess if everyone's in agreement so that we can um, get the legalities of this sorted. Thank you. Um, hopefully five minutes, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Thank you very much for your patience, everyone. That says uh, back and uh, ready to go. So I believe we point, have... Point of order, uh, convener. Um, Sorry, Councillor. Uh, I would like to express my uh, my concern at the uh, the length of that recess, which I think exceeded that for the capital budget uh, at full council, uh, which was dealing with considerably uh, more substantial matters. I would also like to register my concern that um, that that meeting, which was supposed to be with um, proposer and seconder uh, uh, of of the motion extended to part of this committee but not all of it so uh, i think that that was less than transparent yes i, I agreed that totally accept that uh, statement um and when it was brought to attention that was it was the situation was dealt with so i, I accept what you have uh, stated and um yes I, I also agree in the length of time so it's duly noted Councillor Transfer Driver, just say that obviously I appreciate that took some time. Unfortunately, in planning matters, that can often take time, as you may have experienced in the past. Uh, and in terms of uh, where we now are, um, I wasn't in the capital budget process, so I don't know the length of time that took. Uh, but in terms of concern, I'm. Thank God for that. It took four and a half hours. No. <laughs> I am therefore very glad. Um, but in terms of what was discussed, I'm about to summarise that to give members an idea of what was discussed. Yes, there was some detail there, but what we were trying to do, as members know, is um, trying to uh, um, articulate whether there was a motion, whether it was competent to articulate a motion where you have policy grounds. We didn't yet have the why it was breached, and what we're discussing is the why. Now, what I will say is, having said all that, is that Having spoken to councillors Barnacle and Robertson, my view is that um, what they've articulated so far in policy PM1A, RD1 and EP3B, there was no real why. There was also some elements that li linked into what was really the 16% in the housing. So I didn't view those as competent. Um, now th that's certainly my legal view that, that those parts are not competent. However, there is one part that is competent in the sense of uh, LDP2. And, and my understanding is Councillor Barnacle and Robertson are thinking of refusing the basis that the application is premature in terms of their merging in Perth and Cadoss local, local Development Plan 2 on the grounds that firstly, it is proposed to remove the site from the settlement boundary. And secondly, it is proposed that there should be a uh, means connection for foul drainage. Now, um, Whilst competent, what I will say then is that I think that motion still has issues because of the 16 consent. The 16 consent has already considered, uh, well, not directly considered those issues, but it is there and should be taken account of in a, a strong material consideration. So, Councillors Barnacle and Robertson, um, having articulated that, uh, is that the term? Uh, or do you agree with my advice that the three policies of the current LDP, that wouldn't be competent? And do you agree that there is the one ground? Is, is that the ground you're putting forward for refusal? Yeah, I think the main point is that um, it's in the spirit, the LDP2 amendment that council has introduced was in the spirit of improving the policies to protect Loch Leven, and that is very relevant to what we're talking about. So, Councillor Barnacle, are you in agreement that it was now the one ground of refusal which I articulated? Councillor Robson? Yes. Right, thank you. We have a motion. Do we have an amendment? I would like to put forward an amendment that the, uh, the, the paper we uh, put forward as stands. And I have a seconder. Councillor Band will second that. Thank you. Could I just clarify, I'm trying to remember, um, I prepared the report, were there any amendments to the report, Mr. Brown, I can't recall. Yes, there were amendments to the standards for the motion to be passed. So it's approved as amended. Yes. Is that the correct, Councillor Brown? Yes. We're on to the second. Okay, 
Would you like to sum up? I think I've really said what I want to say. <laughs> Let's go to the vote. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I believe that orders us up to a vote. Can I call your name? Could you please ask, advise if you're voting for the motion or the amendment? Sorry, Kerry. Brian, I should articulate that what you have, I should really have articulated this properly. You have the motion by Councillor Bannock and Councillor Robertson to refuse as I've outlined in terms of LGP2. You have the amendment by Councillor McCall and Councillor Bann is to approve as amended. So it's motion refuse, amendment approved. Sorry. Councillor Hearn. Councillor Anderson. Motion. Councillor Bann. Councillor Barnacle. Motion. Councillor Braun. Motion. Councillor Coates. Motion. Councillor Drysdale. Amendment. Councillor Blue. Councillor James. Councillor McCall. Amendment. Councillor Robertson. Councillor Waters. Sorry, I'm having an issue. Hmm? Sorry, I'm going to have to ask this because I can't wait. Councillor Hearn, a motion. Councillor Anderson, a motion. Councillor Bond, amendment. for the motion and four for the amendment the motion is carried okay so the the motion to refuse um has has been passed eight to four um thank you So that takes us on to the, uh, the last paper in front of us, which is a, uh, a pan, um, and it's noted for your... Ah, yeah, sorry, apologies. There is a, a, an update on this. Thank you, convener. Yes, so just a quick update on this in terms of the policies to be considered. Um, as the development site proposed under the pan extends beyond the settlement boundary, uh, we'd also wish to add in policy RD3, which is housing in the countryside, and also the associated housing in the countryside guide, uh, as there'll be two, that'll be a key document and policy which will be relevant in terms of the assessment of any application as and when it might be lodged. Thank you. Okay, is there any comments or questions on the information? No. Thank you very much indeed. Right, well that actually concludes the, the business of uh, planning and development today. But before we let um, Mr. Bryan disappear, um, I have a few words to say. Um, as you're aware, unfortunately, this is uh, Nick Bryan's last planning and development management committee before he retires at the end of the month. Um, and uh, as such, I'd like to take a few minutes to reflect on his career. Um, our last chance to say goodbye. I'll do that in a minute. <laughs> okay, now bear with me because all this information that I have been uh, has been sent to me, so you'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Nick achieved a BA honours degree in town and country planning in 1977 at Liverpool Polytechnic, which is now known as John Moores University. And following this, he gained full membership of the Royal Town Planning Institute, which he's held since 1978. His first job was with Milton Keynes District Council from April 1978 to February 1987. This was a period of significant development in the town. Was it all down to you? Okay. Um, Milton Keynes Bowl venue opened in 1979. Uh, I believe there was uh, gigs by the illustrious uh, groups of Desmond Decker, and Gino Washington, did you, did you attend? I was at gigs at the ball, but not those two. You, know. you surprised me. 
Please, um, please some clean up there. Yeah. Slightly better, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, um, even in those days, um, yeah, it says here, even in those days, I can't imagine a young Nick Bryan attending those, so this was correct. Um, the Milton Keynes stretch of the A5 was opened in 1980. Um, that was replacing the original route along Watling Street, the famous well, Roman Road. Nothing to do with that, I can assure you. <laughs> yeah, it, it says here, they think this was built even before next time. Yes. So there we go. Um, the young planner would have seen some significant uh, developments during this period, including the Central Railway Station in 1982, the General Hospital in 1984, and 1985 had Britain's first multiplex cinema. Um, so I don't think Milton Keynes has been the same since you left. <laughs> Nick then took the brave journey um, north, starting with Kirkcaldy District Council in February 87, before moving to Northeast Fife District Council from May 91 until March 1996. He filled the roles of divisional planner for approximately two years and then chief planner for another two. Following local government reorganization in 1996, Nick became team leader at Fife Council, which he held the position until June 20. Uh, sorry, 2007, at which point Fife's loss became Perth and Canross Council's gain. I think we can all agree. And Nick started with Perth and Canross Council in June 2007 as the development quality manager in the planning team until gaining his current secondment on September 2016 as the interim head of planning. Now, it's easy to see that Nick has planning running through his veins. This has made him what he is today, which is an exceptional senior officer. Through his extensive knowledge and understanding of the planning system, he's earned a reputation as an excellent officer whose advice is sought after by elected members, by members of the public, developers alike, and, and can I say you've been a great help to me as a new convener. Not everyone might like the advice you give, Nick, um, <laughs> but I think we can all agree that your approach has very been, been very much appreciated. He has certainly, in his time, overseen a number of very difficult planning decisions in the area. Tea in the Park, Taymouth Castle, Griffin Wind Farm, Almond Valley, and Schoon North are to name but a few. However, his cheerful manner, good humour, have had the respect of us all. He has also supported a review of the team, which has seen the performance of the planning service within Perth and Kinross go from being at the, in the bottom quartile to one of the best performing in the country. Now, Nick isn't just focused on his work. Mind you, we've got a page and a half of that, but uh, there we go. Um, out of the planning environment, he enjoys a very active life with particular love of running and football. In general, he likes going on various walking and cycling holidays with his wife, Liz. There are stories of him taking in distance running dressed in costumes, such as a dog, for example. Is, is this a new fetish thing that we don't know about? Um, <laughs> which is all for a good cause. He is also part of the planning team fundraising event, Come to Work in a Onesie. Photographs apparently are available for those with a strong constitution. He is also a football fan, so I'm assuming you'll be reasonably ecstatic today with the last night's results uh, in England with the in the World Cup. So now it's time for Nick to move on to the next chapter of his life. I'm sure the committee would join in me in thanking Nick for the many years of committed service to local government to Perth and Kinross in particular, and to wish him a very long and happy retirement. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for those kind words, and uh, I have a lot of admiration for the research that's gone into providing all of that. <laughs> Um, one of the advantages of moving between different councils over a career is that most of the time you're able to leave most of the embarrassing stories behind you. <laughs> but occasionally some of them do keep catch up with you. Um, I think one thing I've always learnt in, in planning over the years is that a key part of it is to build up a, a good relationship with the committee and in particular the conveners. And I think if you can get that mutual trust and respect between officers and uh, members on a committee then it, it makes life so much easier. Although we don't always um, agree on everything, and it was, uh, today was a prime example of that, <laughs> but nevertheless, it, it still means that uh, the, the decision is taken in the best of terms, irrespective of whether there's a disagreement at the end of it. Um, the, 
So I think there's a, the key element there. I've been fortunate as well to work with some very good conveners here. When I first started, it was Willie Wilson, and Willie was very generous, and he allowed me to drive him all over Perth and Kinross <laughs> to every, uh, every, every coffee shop that existed. <laughs> Uh, and he always said that we should bring out a book uh, called Travels with My Convener, which is a guide to <laughs> coffee shops. <laughs> For, fortunately, subsequent conveners haven't put that demand on me. Uh, but I've, I've uh, enjoyed working with Tom Gray in his time as convener, uh, Murray Lyle for a short time, and himself was uh, as convener. And that's, that's been a big, big help. Um, the planning's changed a lot over the years as I've, I've been in the profession, um, thinking back to the very start. Uh, but the, the same core issues have always applied in terms of the ability to deal with the public. Uh, a lot of the time, managing, managing people's expectations, but obviously be mindful of the fact that uh, we are challenged periodically on what we do. Uh, but fortunately, I've been supported by some very good officers over the years. Um, Jamie and uh, David here today, other officers from various teams who come along to committees and provide great support. Uh, and also, unfortunately, Anne Condiff couldn't be here today. She's on holiday. But Anne's been my right-hand woman over the years at committees uh, and has been a big support to me over the years. So there's a big thanks to all the officers involved for everything they've done for me as well. Thank you. Thanks, Green. I would like to reiterate much of what has been said. Uh, I had the great privilege and pleasure of working alongside Nick for five years. Uh, yes, we did not agree on everything. We agreed on a great deal. Nick was always very calm, cool and collected. Mr. Cool, calm and collected. Uh, with a ready smile. And, uh, you know, he had a strong uh, knowledge of his brief, which, of course, he, indeed he, he should have. Uh, and therefore, one could very much rely on Nick. And it had to be a very strong reason not to... Uh, agree with what Nick was putting forward. You had to read pretty hard to get there. In fact, just the other day I sent Nick something uh, because I thought mm, this is going to be a tricky one uh, and it didn't actually come up today. Um, <laughs> 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 Poor Anne. <laughs> uh, so you're getting out in good time. Interesting you made the comment about uh, Willie going to all meetings. The last uh, LRB I was at, Willie was sitting having a cup of coffee with us bought us a cup of coffee and then suggested, I think we should actually uh, have a, a policy of attending uh, site visits for all LRB uh, applications. And uh, we sort of looked around and thought, yeah, what's this about? And of course it was, Willie doesn't drive, Willie likes to see the country. In fact, he said that. He said, it's good to go out and see what's happening around Perth and Ross. And uh, I must say, I did not like Willie, I'm maybe a few inches higher, but I did find sitting in the front or the back of the wee council car with papers galore and Bob in the back or in the front and, and Nick driving, no, nah, any more than enough of these would do me, <laughs> be too much for me. Anyway, Nick, I wish you a long, happy retirement and uh, I happened to visit the E-Tape this year and uh, I didn't see you coming at all. Maybe you were ahead of when I got there or behind, I really don't know. But I look forward to seeing you up there on the bike one day, pedaling in at four hours or whatever you do. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your sports as well. And happy family life. Cheers. Thank you very much, everyone.